right. Well, good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome Professor Eric Johnson uh, to the Arizona Think Tank for Behavioral Decision Making at Eller College of Management. Uh, Eric is a professor at Columbia University at the Business School and a director um, of the Center of Decision Sciences. And his research examines the interface between behavioral decision research, economics, and consumer decision making and with implications for public policy and, and marketing. And among the different topics Eric has been and is investigating is how do we frame uh, choice options that we present to decision makers and how does that affect their choices in a variety of domains such as health decision making, organ donations, for example, environmental um, issues. I think that's a, a a topic that uh, Eric will discuss today, and in financial decision making. Eric's research has been published in uh, the top journals in the general sciences and also in economics and marketing, um, is, has been widely cited over 48,000 times, which is really amazing and had an impact in uh, the popular press, such as the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, uh, Financial Times, and so on. Um, Eric is one of the leaders in the field of consumer research as a fellow of the Association for Consumer Research, uh, has made a huge mark in, in psychology as a, as a fellow there for the Association for Psychological Science. Um, so Eric, it's, it's a true pleasure to have you here um, for the think tank and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Martin, for that very nice introduction. I give it all up to be with you where it's 70 and not 10 degrees and two feet of snow with like it is here. Um, I have many fond memories of being in Tucson for various reasons. So I'll just imagine I'm in, looking at, at some nice cacti, cacti and, and, and mountains. Um, happy to be here. Um, I'm also happy because this is only the second time I've presented uh, this talk. It's gonna be a talk that is structured around a book that I'm even happier to say I'm finished writing. Now that's not to mean between now and next October when it comes out, there won't be running for references and copy editing, but it's been a, an interesting process, a fun process and a chance to summarize a lot of work. Um, there's a very simple theme behind my book. And it's essentially the goal is to basically help people be better designers of choice architecture. The controversial phrase I think I opened the book with is it's an illusion that we alone are responsible for our choices. In fact, we all have hidden partners. If imagine someone who was a presidential advisor who presents options to the president, they have to make a set of choices about which options they present, the order, what the attributes are, et cetera. The same presidential advisor goes home and the next day has to help her eight-year-old get dressed for school and lays out some outfits. They're also deciding how many options, how, et, et cetera. The point is that choice architecture is ubiquitous and we all do it hundreds of times a week, dozens of times a day. So what I wanna zoom in on are these hidden partners, the people who actually are framing choices and help them do a better job of actually posing choices. Winston Churchill was lots of things. One of the things he turned out to be is a critic or an appreciator of choice architecture and architecture itself. Um, it turns out this is the House of Commons, which has been occupied since 1548. It was destroyed by fire in the 1840s and destroyed, really destroyed, by um, one of the last blitz bombings of World War II. There's a famous debate about what they're going to do next. There were many people who thought they should like the American legislature or the Reichstag in Germany build an amphitheater type. And Churchill will have none of this. In one of his most famous speeches, he basically said, we shape our buildings and afterwards our buildings shape us. Although he was a conservative and a traditionalist, that's not why he said we should do that. His argument was that building had characteristics that made it much more functional for the kinds of politics that he had observed at that point, he'd been in parliament for 35 of his 50 years in parliament. Um, and if you look at the building, 
Notice there are two sides. The government is on one side, the opposition on the other. He argued that was one of the reasons Britain had been dominated by a two-party system for most of its existence. The second, that also drew your attention to the opposition, and not to the internecine squabbling that might be happening on your side. You actually were constantly counter-arguing what you were hearing from the other side. This is such a, this is the building after it was rebuilt, but they did lots of details that are important. One of the things that I found interesting, they had social distancing before social distancing was cool. And that is, there is exactly two swords lengths between the two sides. Not that, that that was intentional. And the second thing is that red line is actually the origin of the phrase toe the line. You're not supposed to go over that line to confront the other party. Churchill obviously won. And if you've ever watched something like uh, the prime minister's question time, you realize that the architecture determines a lot of the behavior. And so that's one example. But we don't live in a world of buildings only. We live in a world that's full of lots of artificial environments that are built to help us make decisions. One of the things that's been famous in behavioral economics is the role of New York taxi cabs. And there's a lovely study that was done accidentally. If you take a look here, you'll see the screen that you see on the back of a New York cab. There's, they look almost identical. And it turns out the story is a little bit more complicated, but there was a wonderful experiment run. One of the vendors introduced a screen that had options of 15%, 20%, and 25%. The other had 20%, 25%, or 30%. Notice nothing here is changing your ability to tip. If you want to tip 15% on the screen that's on your right, pop, 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 you can do that. If you want to tip nothing, you can do that. There's no change in the options. But what was remarkable is that actually there were six people who were six times more likely to tip 15% when it was available as a one touch button than when they were given the screen on the right. Because some cabbies are randomly assigned to cabs, this essentially became a very nice experiment. And what they found is the cabbies who were given the right hand side screen made on average, I want to get the number exactly right, 27% more on those shifts. You know, think about it as a cabbie, you would love to change jobs to get a 20% raise, 7% raise. All it took was giving a separate, a different set of buttons on the back. This is a good example of how church architecture actually has incredible implications, not just in the large in terms of lives saved and lives lost, but also in the small in terms of people's daily income. In fact, in San Francisco recently, there was a threat, a strike of delivery people because they added a 10% option to the, their app. And they were afraid, rightly so, that people would tip less. By the way, I should say, I'd love to have questions. If you want to interrupt, maybe the easiest way is to just raise your hand. I have that the user interface up. I don't mind at all answering questions. I might wait till later if it's something I'm going to get to, but please feel free. Let me stop there and see if there's any questions. Great. And if you're shy, I have the chat up too. Um, so another place where we have enormous um, interactions with electronic interfaces has become the doctor's office. All of our doctors, if you go to, have gone to the doctor in the last couple of years, they spend a lot of time not looking at you, but looking at something called the electronic health record. In fact, anthropologists who study this and study people going to their doctors in the, in the examination room say that about half the time is spent talking to the patient, but 37% of the time is actually interfacing with this EHR. So the EHR has turned out to be a public architecture. And there's a large industry now looking at how you can use this to change habits. There have been bad examples, which I won't talk about today, involving opioids and other um, bad choice architecture. Let me tell you a story that's actually much more pleasant, and that's about generic drugs. Generic drugs are medically equivalent to, in most cases, to, to brand name drugs. They actually not only save money, they cost about 20 cents on the dollar. But it turns out, if you read the literature, they save lives. Why? For many dr drugs, if drugs are too expensive, people do not continue to take them. They don't have what medicine, what people in that field call high compliance. 
Instead, they stop taking the drugs and in cases of drugs like high blood pressure, that can be a, truly a disaster. So generics actually help people be healthier, particularly people who aren't well off. Despite that, many doctors still prescribe brand name drugs. I'll give you one example. Allegra is in history plus five times more than the generic, which is called fexofenadine hydrochloride. Okay. Generics were only one hospital. Uh, this is Cornell Vial Hospital in New York City. We're only 46% of all prescriptions, even though essentially you're buying the same thing and paying five times as much money. Now, there have been lots of efforts to try and change prescribing behavior. As you might expect, there were seminars. There actually are other studies where people are actually, doctors actually paid what an economist might think would be a great solution. We're gonna pay people to prescribe generics. We'll sort of split the, the, the rent, um, but none of those worked. But uh, these researchers at Cornell Vial found a way to boost that from 46% to over 96%. How did they do it? What was the magic? Well, to understand this, I think we need to have a better idea of what the diagnosis was. What was the way that, what was the cause of people prescribing brand name drugs? Turns out the name of brand name drugs, but not the name of the gener generic. Think about it, Allegra, I know. Fexofenadine hydrochloride, I have to look at this slide every time because I don't remember it myself, even after writing about it. It's much harder. This is reinforced by lots of marketing. The brand name drugs have been detailed, advertised. You have notepads on your desk with the drug name on it. This has been the name that the drug was known for the first 10 or 15 years of its use. Um, so what these doctors did was simply change the interface. So if you typed in the case of Allegra, A-L-L, -L, it would auto-populate the field by saying fexofenadine hydrochloride. It would just basically overcome the lack of recall by being external memory and providing the doctor with that name. Now, to indicate this was not being forced on people, one click away, you could go back to the original drug, but over 90% of prescriptions kept the generic, okay? And so this example and the cab example, I think are really interesting for two reasons. They make big changes in behavior, with the very small interventions. And they don't fit what we think about as the standard checklist of Troy architecture. You're going to, to hear me talk about defaults. That's what most people think about. But neither of these were default implementations. The real key, I think, in understanding both of them is there's a common, two common mechanisms for most choice architecture. And that's sort of what the book is about. I'm going to actually argue that almost all choice architecture can be classified as working through two means. The first of these is gonna be changes in the effort, what I'm gonna call plausible paths. This is basically how people actually decide how to decide. For those of you who know the literature, you'll say he's just talking about strategy selection, but I think plausible paths get the, the idea across to people better. The second is it changes the way we access memory. Many of you will know the concept of constructive preferences. I'm calling that assembled preferences for a very simple reason. Constructive sounds like I'm making things up. The real problem is we have too many preferences and we have to put them together. And we'll come back to that in a second. But basically, I think you can argue that most choice architecture works through these two mechanisms. I'll stop there to see if there are any questions.